Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Psalms 119, verses 17. You're going to enjoy tonight. You're going to enjoy tonight. Give me the amplified version of that. It says, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and I will observe your word hearing receiving loving and obeying it our God is a God of bounty tell your neighbor my God is a God of bounty you know what bounty means He's a God of big things He's a God of bigness are you hearing me so if you came into Christianity with a small mentality, you're in the wrong faith. Are you hearing me? I said if you came into Christianity with a small mentality, you were in the wrong faith. Because the God you chose to believe is a God of bounty. The men that served and walked with God expected a certain bountiness with God. Somebody say amen. And so he says, deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and I will observe your word, hearing, receiving, loving, and obeying it. Hearing, receiving, loving, and obeying it. Hearing, receiving, loving, and obeying it. And then he made a prayer that I want to focus my teaching on tonight. He says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. For I am a stranger and a temporary resident on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. He says, open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. The first time I read that scripture, of course, many years ago, I was taken aback into some of the first experiences I had when I'd encountered God. One of the most liberating experiences of a Christian faith is a soul that has been exercised in the divine experience. Did you hear that? One of the most liberating experiences of a Christian life is a soul that has been exposed or has been aligned, has come in contact with divine experience. When a soul gets in contact with God a certain way, and experiences the divine things there's a certain liberty that comes to you it has no words but you can tell the intensity of that liberty by the things that start to catch you are you hearing me and I remember during that time when God had seized me you know there's a point where people get God but I'm talking about a point where God gets you. And you know this time he has me. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about when you capture God. I'm talking about when God captures you. And you know that this time he has me. And I remember during that time when God had me. And let me say this. That it doesn't matter how long you live. How, uh, you know, whatever you go through in life. There comes a point when the human soul is awakened. Are you hearing me? There comes a point where God has you and you know <laughs> that God has got you. I'm not talking about that catching or protecting you. That's one of those things. When somebody says God has got me, in other words, he means to say I'm under his hand, he's protecting me, shielding me from harm, from pain, from turmoil, temptation. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the kind of God touching you and you are awakened to eternal purpose. And he is like as though saying, come, I want to use you. And you look at every inefficiency in your life. You look at all the shortcomings of your life. 
you look at all the mistakes on you. You look at all the imperfections on you. And if you have read the Bible, there are many, many instances in Scripture that could allude to men who had experiences of such, where God got them at a particular point. And you can see by how unready they are when they react. They react in a sort of unreadiness. They react in a sort of perplexity, confusion, fear. Not in a bad way, but what does he want with me? Because, you know, it's one thing to know God, but it's another when you really know him beyond the usual conversations that people have about him. You understand it? To really now know that I'm actually in the presence of the creator of heaven and earth. The all-present, all-powerful, omniscient, omnipotent God who created the world by a breath and speech. As in, as the way it sobers you up, because it's one thing to relate with him without a certain experience. And you read in scripture where God comes to a man, and a man so shaken in fear, says, depart from me from a sinful man. You understand what I'm saying? He does big experiences of miracle and wonder. And these disciples start to repent of their sin. They just start repenting of their sin. The Bible says when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' feet and he says, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. What had he seen? He had come in contact with a certain presence. There was a certain awakening of his nature versus the nature he had come in contact with. When you are in contact with familiar man, right, men of the same kind and nature, of the same identity and life, not many things catch you. Although, of course, there are people who are still fascinated by people of the world. You find a born-again Christian. And then they meet Michael Jackson. They say, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And you're like, Yo, you understand what I'm saying? One time I was in a very interesting place. I'd gone for a travel. And I met a very, very popular fellow in the world. Very popular fellow in the world. Very popular. Huh? And I was flying first class. And this guy enters. Just like this. You understand what I'm saying? That's when I knew hey, I'm born again. I saw him. And I said, yeah, he's familiar. I've seen him in the movies. What? You know, very popular guy. Some people, if they met him, oh, my God. <laughs> you understand? Very popular fellow. And I looked at him. He comes in. Hi. I saw him. Hi. I just washed my hand. Not because I'm proud. And I didn't try to compose myself. But that's when I realized the world died to me long ago. You understand what I'm saying? Because I'm seeing this guy, and I can see a normal human being with nothing. Not that I don't celebrate his achievements in the world, but that if he died now, he would admire even the shroom wearing, because it's part of my lot. Do you understand what I'm saying? Be proud to be born again. Somebody shout, Amen. Know who you are when you're called by his name. That you're not an ordinary man. You are special. You're God's choicest people. Shout, Amen. Shout, Hallelujah. But then we see the ultimate wonder, God. And we see men in scripture who come in contact with him. And they're afraid. And then he wants to send them off. Where shall I go for? I am young, I'm weak, and I'm a man of unclean lips. You understand what I'm saying? You start to see when they come in contact with God, they are awakened to their human frailty, the frailty of human nature. And everybody needs that experience. Because until you understand that, you will never appreciate why righteousness is imputed on you by faith. Why God's grace is available for you. Why you are forgiven of sin. Why you are cleansed. Why you are a new creation. You'll understand the boldness that you're supposed to carry to the present. Of course, the 
physical self has to adjust. Are you following what I'm saying? Why does the physical self have to adjust? There are many supposed opinions and ideas, and many of them so wrong about the realm of the spirit, the eternal realm of God and the realm of darkness. There is a huge confusion with many people about what really is there. Many Christians are born again and they are born of God and of the Spirit. Paul says, now that we live in the Spirit, he says, let us walk in the Spirit also. Do you know the meaning of that statement? Now that you live in the Spirit, if we live in the Spirit, he said, let us walk in the Spirit also. He said that the Spirit realm is your inheritance as a child of God. And it's not a place of visitation. It's a place where you live. Are you hearing me? It's a place where you what? You live. There is more activity in the world that is not seen than the activity that is seen. And when you live in the world that is seen for so long and get so familiar in the world that is seen, the day your eyes are open in the world that is not seen, if you have not been trained in the Spirit to see things through the eyes of God, many things can destroy you and shake you off your balances. That is why sometimes it's not healthy to share divine experiences because no words can define certain identities until you come in contact with those things. It's like if a man is open to the spirit realm before they understand God, what they might see in the spirit realm in its quote-unquote reality will and should be contrary to the way another man would see in the spirit in what they might define reality as. The Bible says, Who God at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in the time past unto the fathers by the prophets. And he says, But he has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the world. Okay? Now, when Satan, Lucifer, that fallen fellow, has to define the spirit realm to the believer, do you think he will define that realm according to the way the heir of all things fashion these worlds? Who is understanding what I'm saying? Huh? Okay. Let me make it simpler. He says, Who God at sundry times and in diverse manners spake and to us by the fathers, the prophets. Okay? And he says, But he has in this last day spoken unto us by his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed heir of all things and by whom also he made the world, the eons, the ages. Okay? Now we're not talking about the world. That's a spiritual word. It's not a physical word. It's a spiritual world. It's a world that is unseen. Those are the ages, the eons. Okay? The things in which you design Kairos. And whether you want it or not, even the cohorts of darkness have a designing of this world. They pick certain things spiritually. You remember the girl in the book of Acts, who had the spirit of divination, Apollos. Okay? And the Bible says, and she brought her master's much gain through soothsaying. And it came to pass, as the apostles went to pray, this woman, she followed Paul, and that's crying. This was a woman speaking, crying, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which showeth unto us the way of salvation. There is a spirit of divination at work 
in a girl. Okay? That was not a prophetic spirit. Who is understanding what I'm saying? That was not a what? A prophetic spirit. But even though that was not a prophetic spirit, it could discern according to the eons, according to the understanding of the eternal realms, that these were men that were sent by God, that they should show us the way of salvation. Are you hearing me? I wish people will understand that even the most false spirit can affirm a minister of God. Who has understood what I'm just saying? Even a familiar spirit, apostles, divination, if it meets a man of God, it can say, that is a man of God. That's a father in the spirit. You can say, ah, if it's false, how come it has recognized that this is a man of God? No, because it is given to them to know certain things in the spirit realm. They can design certain things in the spirit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You remember the devils that Jesus finds into a man, legion, and then they ask, what do you want with us? It's not yet time. What do you want with us? How did these devils design the time of when the Christ was to deal with them? They say certain things. They have a clue about the realm. They have a few clues. So when they say, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of God, Most High, I beseech thee to torment me not. For it's not yet the time and hour for you to torment me. It means the Spirit is trying to claim a certain right not to be cast out. It is debating Christ according to Kronos and Kairos. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is saying, according to the Spirit's timing, this is not your time to do this. They might have mistaken that little rebuke for the end time of torment, but they are familiar with the end time consequences. Are you seeing? So I think when this devil meets Jesus, it cannot tell whether they just want to rebuke it out or it's meeting the tormentation that was spoken to it for. You understand what I'm saying? And um, that's why when the Bible speaks in Chronicles and says, and these are ancient things, okay? Sometimes we desire to make certain conversations with the church concerning certain things that I think we must know in this life. The things I think we must know in this life concerning the ancient, the things past. And I think are very important for any man who takes their salvation seriously. It's more than just history. It's more than just history. It's how our past is connected to the present hour. And how that is also connected to the future events of the Christian faith. And how many people live a life of Christianity but without that awakening, they are easily misinterpreting the signs and times and the ways of the Spirit eternal. I don't know whether I'm making sense. It's important for somebody to dig out and really understand why are we as a church where we are and why are things attacking us in the body of Christ like the way they are attacking us. Why do we see madness in the church like we're seeing it? Why do we see the hearts of men waxing more and more evil? What is happening spiritually that is having effects in the physical world that is making men more and more wicked? Men are inventing things that are killing themselves every other day and they are becoming wiser. And some of us think they're just scientists. No. Huh? Some of you were walking to the news one day of uh, one of the brothers of the leaders, Kim Jong-un. He's in North Korea. And uh, his half-brother, 
was walking through an airport in, uh, I believe, was it Malaysia? And a woman comes and puts the substance on his face. He reports, of course, to the officials, but a few minutes later, he's short of breath, and then an ambulance dies that evening. And uh, they get his body and take it for tests, and the autopsy report says that what kills this man was a nerve agent that was made many years ago. It has no taste. It has no color. If a man puts it in his hands, it's like water. But if he gets that water and smears it on your face, it's enough to choke you and paralyze your whole system, respiratory, nervous, and kill you in seconds. Do you think that a man can sit in a laboratory and think to create such a poison and it's not demonic inspired? Are you following what I'm saying? And it's not demonic inspired? A parent got a child and took them to school and educated them about the science and chemical. And this young man invented a nerve agent, a weapon. And today, more than ever before now, we are starting to hear that even some of the diseases that are outside there were made in a laboratory by men which sat under machines and created something that a man can inhale and it destroys their life. Of course, that's the physical understanding. But what is the spiritual interpretation? Are you following me? Now men are making weapons of that nature. They're no longer making guns as such. They're starting to invent things that can kill you in the least expected way. And all of that is working in the minds of men. What is science doing? Eastern meditations have been imported now. They're like a daily line of worship and well living. Transcendental meditation. They're teaching kids in schools how to summon devils over them. It's happening in Europe and the United States of America. Not yet in Africa, and I pray it won't. Are you hearing me? There's just too much outside that when you are of a keen eye to start to study, eh, now... We've had what they call transhumanists. Guys who think that they can create another kind of human being out of the human being that is existent. But what is the consequence? They're trying to say that what God made is not enough. We want to create our own kind of man that is superior from the usual thing God called. And like the temptation that Lucifer had in the back of his head. They want to build a God without God. What do you need God for when the next human being will not fall sick? What do you need God for when the next human being will be all-knowing because his brain can be connected to the internet and he accesses information at the speed of light or even faster than that? Why do you need God when they can build cities in the sky? Because they want to be like God. And they want to be worshipped. Hallelujah. And as you study deeper, you realize that every other day, things are awakening in the other realm that the average Christian does not know about. And these things are ancient. They are ancient. They are ancient. Praise God. They are what? They are ancient. Satan has devised the power to be. Because to be means he can make you. You understand? That's how men sell their souls. Because he can come to you and tell you, I can make you this. I can make you this. He's learned the art of creating certain glories, false glories, of course, and making certain men. Are you hearing me? You remember the story of Nimrod, the descendant of Cush? Huh? You remember that guy? If you read in the Bible concerning Nimrod, 
the Bible says he began to be a mighty man. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. The Bible says, and Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Okay? Now, if you read the literal translation in the Genesis 10, 8, where they say, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth, it means that there was a process, there was a period, spiritual, where Nimrod connected to a spirit higher than him, and it started to create a certain might around his life. Are you following what I'm saying? And that's the guy who begets demonic worship and builds Babylon, the tower, Babel. And what's the meaning of Babel? Huh? What's the meaning of Babel? Okay, what's the meaning of Nimrod? Nimrod means rebellious one. And because of rebellion, he built confusion. Babel, confusion. Babel means confusion. Now, if the rebellious one began to be a mighty one, when you study ancient texts, you realize he started to attract certain spirits about him that started making a certain might around him. And all oh, the devil can make men. The devil can make men. You remember Michael Jackson in those days? Huh? The guy would get on stage and people faint and pass out like they're slain by a power. That's just how much presence this man had on his life. And of course, it wasn't godly. It wasn't godly. But Michael Jackson would get on the stage, and people start passing out. They're not fainting because they can't breathe. But the presence on him was overwhelming. But it was a demonic energy. It was a demonic energy. It was a star. He was a star. You understand what I'm saying? The devil can make. Praise God. And so, it only takes a certain eye by God to open your eyes to understand that that is nothing. You heard of a basketballer who died. He always said that he wanted to die young. Huh? And be mortalized. So they can remember him like another rapper who died a couple of years ago. He was gunned down again in L.A. And he also was a popular rapper. And there's a deception that Satan has put in certain individuals. That be the best at this, I'll make you. It's the serpent power, he used to call it. Huh? The mamba. The mamba. He, he believed that he had an extra <laughs> power. And then he dealt and he was ready for fame to die at a young age and be immortalized. Because that's all he thinks he could ever live for. If the devil had told him that on the day of his death he was going to lose his daughter, I don't think he would have entered that deal. But that's what the devil does. He always has something behind something. That will make a man lose more. If that fellow knew that he was going to be buried with his daughter, he would have lost everything and lived a normal life and lived his full life to raise his own children. Because the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. But there are people who for the price of fame would sell their soul. Because Satan has convinced them that this is all they will ever see. Now understand me. When a man says in Psalms 119, that open my eyes that I might see the wondrous things in your law. It is because they stuff outside that could capture my wonder. Are you hearing me? But I want that wonder to be in the word. I want my eyes to be open a certain way. That when bounty comes, it comes with a certain understanding. That when my eye is opened by God, when my eyes are opened by God to see, they are seeing through the vision of his word and the person of Jesus Christ. So the Bible says that now he's by Christ, which is the word that became flesh and dwelt among men and we beheld his only glory as a true son of God, full of grace and truth. When you see Christ, Paul says, but now we see Jesus. But now we see Jesus. When we say, but now we see, by what eyes do we see him? He says, but now we see Jesus. But now we see Jesus. But now we see Jesus. 
I now see Jesus. That vision that God gives you of Christ, that any fame, any glory, any praise, any greatness, any definition of greatness in the world cannot compare to the indescribable gift Jesus. Everything else starts to look dull. The man said, turn your eyes. You remember that song? Upon Jesus. He had to see something. He had to see Jesus a certain way. But you see, this person of Christ has come in the expression of his word. The only way he can appear clearly to a man is through the word. Somebody shout amen. It's through the word. He was in the beginning with God and nothing that is made that was made without him. Nothing. He was there in existence from the foundations of the earth. This person, Jesus, was there. He was there. He is the express image of the invisible God. Yet we must understand the image that is not in flesh. For he says, for we behold, we regard no man in the flesh. Even the Christ who we should regard in the flesh is far long beyond the terrestrial. But he is still the express image of the invisible God. In other words, this God you don't see is in the expression of the person of Jesus Christ. And no man can see him that way and tread with the world. No man. No man. That is why Paul says, For had they known this wisdom, they would not have crucified the God of glory. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why does Paul call him the Lord of glory? Because even in the distinction of glory, are you hearing me? We have a lordship. There's a lordship to everything you define as glory. Because the sons of men have a very free understanding of what the glory of God is. When you ask them, what is the glory of God? For some, it only ends in the crooked med straight, in the valley raised, in the mountain level. And that's okay. But the crooked are only med straight that a man would walk therein. Those paths are not the man's destiny. No, they are a journey to the man's destiny. And some stay lost in there. They don't understand that God level the valley, that when you're walking, you don't need to have a problem going down and up to skip up. That God level the mountain, that you don't need to sweat going up. That he made a crooked road straight and a rough place plain, that he might help you make your journey smooth on this quest. Many of them get excited in the smoothening of the rough edges, in the making straight of what is crooked, in the valley that is raised and the mountain that is leveled. And they don't understand why did God level it. And that is why certain glories are dangerous for a man who cannot see the end. Certain glories are dangerous for a man who cannot see the end. And if it were certain things would have delayed or should have delayed on the lives of certain individuals until they got the full understanding of what they really were entrusted with. That is why the Son of God tells us, look, count the cost. Count the cost. He's not talking about the physical amount of money. No. He's trying to help you get the picture of the price of this thing that is bigger than you. So when Paul starts to say, I have a cost, there is a cost. I thought there is only a gift and there is a calling that you do until you end. No, he says, no, I have a cost. I have run my race. I have finished my course. Oh, so there is a cost in the Christian faith. Yes. So how can we even talk about course without designing the other world? How can you talk about course when you can't understand Kairos? Huh? How can you talk about course when you don't understand the signs of the Kairos? How can that be? 
And what is Satan doing in the darkness? He has created his own eons. Because he knows the power of eons on the days of men in this one life. And to understand that, why do you think the verse, open my eyes that I may behold the wondrous works of your law. The next line says, for I am a stranger and a temporary resident on the earth. Why does the man say, for I am a stranger and a temporary resident on the earth? Because he knows that when a man is awakened to eternal purpose, he seeks to see. He seeks to see. It's the essence of vision. When a man is awakened to eternal purpose, he seeks to see. He seeks to see. There's just no way that man won't see. Oh, I'm going somewhere. Now, they're reading the stars. And these stars are telling them their days. The sun is telling them their moments of worship. The zodiac is telling them of their futures. And it's division. The Leo, the Vago. Oh God. It's just a lot. <laughs> and by the zodiac, men are explaining traits and personalities. They are creating opportunities for men. Those of you used to read your stars back in the air, this week, there's a great favor for financial advancement. Take heed of the people you meet, for through those opportunities, the doors are open to you. And men believe them. And indeed, if you used to read your stars, some of you, many of them were connected to the things around you. You would say, this week you're going to be disappointed. You're nursing a disappointment. And when you read it, it's so, and you're like, ah, oh, did they know? Do you understand what I'm saying? And now men are reaching out for things beyond even the tectonic plates, they are reading I mean, oh, Aethan goes beyond this thing and is seeing. <laughs> and they're not using machines only now. These are ancient things. They're very old. Recently I was reading about a fellow <laughs> who got under a certain spell many years ago. And he read about all the popes that would exist under a certain spirit. And each pope that he has spoken about for the past hundreds of years, they have been so as he saw. And he wasn't seen by the prophetic eyes of God. Now they took and see through the future and define destinies of nations, empires and generations. And the children of God are walking on in darkness without understanding. It is for I say ye are gods, but you die like mere men, he said. Because our knowledge is supposed to be in the person of Jesus Christ. He is supposed to be the ultimate revelation. He's supposed to be the ultimate revelation. How can it be so boring to live the Christian faith? The light of salvation. When Peter says these things angels inquire to look into. You know the Spirit of the Lord showed me something remarkable. One time when I was reading that scripture. When he says that the things angels desire to look into. It means if the angelics from the understanding of the mystery of salvation. They've been studying to understand how much have they learned. Did you understand what I just said? How much have they learned? He says, for these things, the angels of which salvation, he says, the prophets of old did preach, in verse 10. He says, they inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, and such in what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when he did testify beforehand the sufferings of Christ, 
and the glory that should follow after, and to whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things angels desire to look into. That means when you talk about the mystery of salvation, the angelics want to know. So, how can a person tell me that salvation is boring? When those that sat next to God in glory and saw Him and worshipped and bowed before Him, they have seen the very form of God. They can still come back and want to hear a believer teaching. Yet their fascination is not in vision anymore. The usual vision of what they've seen by God or before God. In other words, when we are talking about the life of salvation, we're talking about a deeper vision. Otherwise, angels would not desire to look into. No, no. We're not talking about the fascinations you hear, guys. Oh, you know, today, you just need to tell a man, you know, I walked in heaven last week. And people say, oh, then you're like, oh, God. Angels dwell there. But they leave that estate to come and listen to certain men. Who has understood what I just said? Angels which see heaven with their eyes every day. They know the glassy sea. They know the way around it. They see everything around. They observe everything around. Let me make a very very deep statement. When the mind, the human mind, awakens to heavenly realities, it stops to breathe. Did you understand it? When the human mind is awakened to heaven realities, it stops to breathe. Because only the spirit can connect with the life there. And so I wonder sometimes, when men try to seek with their spirit what they hope only to understand by the mind. Paul says in Corinthians, the Amplified, in the, uh, Second Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 1, he says, true... There is nothing to be gained by it. He's giving an example. But as I'm obliged to boast, I'll go on to visions and revelations. He says, I know a man in Christ, in Christ, who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. He says, that man was caught up to the third heaven. And the Bible says, and I know that this man, whether in the body or away from the body, I do not know. God knows. When he entered the certain realm of heaven, his mind doesn't even know whether he was in the body or out of the body, whether he was away from the body. And he says, and I was caught up in paradise. And he had, that man had utterances beyond, listen, the power of man to put into words. Beyond the power of man to put into words. Beyond the power of man to put into words. And he says, which man is not permitted to utter? Here, in this permission, he's talking about the ability of the mind. The human mind is not allowed to articulate such experiences. Now, Paul tells you he was there once. He saw things the human mind had not power to put into words. That's why I said that there is a realm in the heavenly places where your mind will stop to breathe. Are you hearing me? And when the mind stops to breathe, you'll understand the sanctification of the spirit that allows you to interpret heavenly phenomena. When you come back, you can't worship with the man of the mind. I am speaking. But some of the things I'm speaking, my mind can't. I can only 
take you to the end of how much measure by faith God has given me by the articulation of my spirit to catch the certain vision through my eyes with the hope that when your eyes see, you will see more than I've said. Christ the vision. Christ the vision. So he told me, if angels desire to look into these things, and they have been looking from the onset of salvation, and they are hungry now than they were last year, and they were hungry last year than they were in the year before. If angelics have been alive for thousands of years, salvation, the mystery, is still a place of hunger. He says, they that hunger and thirst for righteousness they shall be filled. For there cannot be hunger or a thirst of a thing of where there is no more of it. Now we're not talking about righteousness as a doctrine. That is imputed. We're talking about righteousness as a function. That is attached to divine purpose. What is my part and lot in this? Why am I alive? He's an ancient thing. Praise God. Praise God. So we cannot understand him only in the mind. We cannot. The mind can try, but we cannot. That is why when we get into the space of meditation, the mind can never meditate enough where God wants to take the spirit. It's not possible. That is why he talks about the inner mind, the inner man. The eyes are flooded with understanding. It's a light of the glorious gospel that can only light the darkness of ignorance. There are certain things that I know not because I read the Bible. I just know them. Because I've encountered God a certain way. Many years ago, I met people who used to say, I've read the Bible 40 times. I've read the Bible 60 times. I've read the Bible 70 times. I've read the Bible 80 times. And I used to admire them. And then one day I went to God. said, I want to read the Bible like them. I want to open the Bible and read it one time, 20, 200, 100 times. I love God enough that I would read the Bible and want to read it a trillion times if I have to. And I would read it over and over. And the Spirit by understanding helped me see something. He asked me a question. He said, how many of those that read it teach it the way I want it to be taught? Wow. I was shocked that actually even those that read it a thousand times, 45 times, 50 times, when they began to speak, there was something. that could only speak an acquaintance with a text they've read for so long, but not the person and the spirit behind it. And God told me, it's one thing to read the word. It's another for me to speak to the man reading it. Are you hearing me? And he said, that's the essence of divine instruction. That's the revelation of my heart. That's the articulation and the demystification of all things known by men to be mystery, but are free and simplified in me. And he told me, never walk in the light of comparing yourself with men who have read this thing many times because of how I speak to you. And I realized that as the kind who could read three verses, and those three verses hit me for seven hours. So I used to ask myself why I'm not moving at the speed. 
But because everything that I read had a wonder. It was an apocalypse. It was unveiling something so deep. Sometimes I would read something so simple and I would pull myself back and say, oh God, this is too much for me. Do you know that up to today, I can read one scripture and that one scripture, God speaks for seven or eight hours on one scripture. When I encounter that, I do not think I'll ever read from Genesis to Revelation in a definitive period of time. It cannot happen. Because every time I see the word, something opens up to me and I realize now I have come to the realization and the uttermost fear of men that stumble on these things the way I do, you start to realize that your time on earth is so short to fully understand these things. Because when you think you know, he takes you deeper. When you think you have seen, he shows you more. Shall we ever explore every depth to its degree of every chapter and verse or precept in this one life? I don't see that possible. God is bottomless. And I started to think, what could befall on the man who treads the biggest part of this experience? When I raise a child, where should I begin to speak to them about God? Should I get all my hours of experiences and walk in God and invest myself in them and tell them every day if I have to of everything I have known to be true in God and for a venture believe that if my boy at 13 or 14 years old can have what I had at 30 or 34, maybe, just maybe, I've redeemed another 20 years of his time to invest himself in higher understanding. Now I think about the children I raised. Every time I stand before you, every Thursday, every Friday, every Sunday, I'm hoping for adventure that this thing will be scattered through us. That as I'm digging in this, you're digging, you're digging, she's digging, we are digging, and we get to speak with each other. And fellowships are committed where women take each other out not to gossip about who did what, but they sit over cups of tea to say, I was reading Hebrews 12. And oh, it blew me. Don't you see it's connected to Luke chapter 5? Don't you see it's connected to Matthew chapter 3? Don't you see that this is where it's connected to Leviticus? That God will raise a generation that will ascend to heights higher and fields vast in exploration. That our spirits will start connecting to higher things. That men will look at us and ask, which school did you go to? Because the things we shall speak will be so old for our age. And so deep for any man to reign. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. Serve the Lord. That's why I'm saying, raise your children deliberately. We cannot continue gathering just to cast out devils. Somebody must transcend that. But yeah, when you feel pain, cut it out. But after cutting it out, 
May your eyes be open to see the wondrous things in the word of God. For you just visitors. You are pilgrims on the earth. And your time is short. Even if you live for 100 years or 200, it is still not going to be enough. There are men in scripture that lived for 900 years, but it was still not enough for them to demystify the mystery of Christ. He is bottomless. My question is, where are you in this question? And how I feel sorry for the man who has not understood anything in what I just shared. Because Satan has filled you with many troubles and thoughts of failure. Why isn't my marriage working? Why is this failing? Because he knew if he can get us busy there, our eyes cannot look into. Well, God wants to kill you to a point where regardless of whatever it is, your eyes will stay fixed on God. Not so that that disease will leave you, but that they'll stay fixed on God, that your eyes will stay awakened to the wonder of his word. Lord of creation, Son of God, and Son of man, true. Somebody pray. 
this is my prayer for you. That wherever you are at in life, wherever you are at with your God, I do not know where you are in the spectrum of these things spoken. But my honest prayer to God for you and I is that may God take us deeper. May God launch us deeper. May God take you places. Beyond knowledge. As men know it. May God show you wisdom. Beyond wisdom as men know it. May God bring out of you something. That the world has never seen. That the world has never heard. The world has never come in contact with. May God bat in somebody a ministry that will shake the corners of this earth, that will level mountains and raise valleys, yeah. make the crooked places straight and the rough edges plain, that the children of God might encounter the King of Glory. May God put something on you as I never fixed mark that separates you even among those who know him. May God put a distinction on your life. May he elevate you. May he take you so far. May the word be open to you. May your eyes see the wondrous things in his word. May you know the person of Jesus like never before. May you die to the things you must die to and live to the things you must live. And as he shows you his word, the anointing of God will set on your life in a grace and magnitude like you've never imagined before. There are always higher places to go in God. There are always deeper spaces to go in God. And those things are accessed only by grace. God takes somebody to the next level. Raise somebody to the next place of glory. Raise that man to the next realm of understanding. Raise that woman to another level of revelation. Deeper God. Deeper God. Deeper God. And the Bible says and the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as waters cover the sea. And that can only come through knowledge. The Bible says in the last days knowledge shall be increased. In a time when men are moving north and south, east and west, searching for the word, may you have increased. May you have more than they need. May God overwhelm men through you with the spirit and power of revelation. Because where revelation is, glory is. The anointing is. The miraculous is. The signs are. The wonders are. That is your portion. Give him a mighty hand of praise. Receive it and say it's mine. In Jesus' mighty name. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, and you're not born again, I want to beseech you by God. If you're there and you want to be born again, to repeat this word after me. Say, Lord Jesus, today my heart receives you. Say, I believe you died for my sin. And you were raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. God bless you. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041 466 4291 or email us at 
funerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.funero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.